You know, welcome and thank you so much. It's so great to see such a turnout. I mean, in the early days of the gallery, um, as you can see, we didn't anticipate so many people would come. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, uh, so this is Helm, and this is a project from co-owners uh, Karina Argudo, which is right here filming us. And George, who's not ringing the bell downstairs because he's too ill to come. There's a bug going around town. And that bug has uh, struck down uh, David Rose, who was supposed to have been here, but uh, he can't make it today. So I hope that those guys can get better soon. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Gwinnell Carol Ledoux uh, to be here, and Adam Simon to be with us. Uh, uh, fellow artists, and the room is full of fellow artists, uh, but these two guys got got tapped on the shoulder to come in to, uh, to weigh in and um, cross-examine me, maybe, or something like that. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, so the topic uh, will be about what I wanted to lay out. Basically, what we do is a kind of intersection, of, like a Venn diagram of two elements. One is a regard for art history, kind of a perspective. Um, after we immerse ourselves in it, we have a point of view about it, what we like, what we don't like, what we believe, what we don't believe. And we come up with certain conclusions, whether they're concrete or they're implied, it doesn't really matter. It's a point of view that we acquire after you sort of looked at our history from a little kid uh, going forward, a kind of attitude about it. And that intersects with um, who we are as people. That's sort of an inevitable thing about where we've grown up and who raised us and what we've seen and what we've been exposed to. So just by uh, object example then, uh, um, just to say that uh, it was, uh, I think most of us who are artists have had the same experience where you've been drawing, uh, you get praised for doing that sort of, you, or you get a charge from drawing. I, I know personally that uh, my grandmother's box of Ticonderoga pencils were like a, a, a treasure uh, when I was a kid. Like, I would love the smell of them. I, I knew where exactly where they were. I, I count them in the box and, and want more of it or something like that. And I think we've all had that kind of experience in various ways. Um, but it wasn't until I, would, uh, vis I was visiting the Prado when I was a kid. I was born in Madrid, but I came back when I was 14 because my family was traveling to, uh, to uh, actually emigrate to Australia for six brief months before we came back to the States. It's a long story, but uh, along the way, we stopped in, in Madrid, and uh, I was able to see the Prado. And not only that, I saw um, to, uh, Toledo and El Greco's paintings there. And at how 14... Old, how old were you then? 14. And um, uh, it really marked me that time. So um, uh, standing before uh, Saturn devouring his children was like a, like a sort of a like you're high on acid or mushrooms or something like that. It was kind of like some strange out of body in, in the presence of that painting kind of experience. In the years since, um, there's a natural thing where you have to, you get impressed by the development of um, uh, abstract art, like say Malevich and uh, the school that Chagall created and and had taken away from him by the constructivists and the suprematists, which is itself quite a story. But um, I had quite a regard for Malevich, but also you can't help but have a, a kind of respect for Picasso and all that stuff. And after all the Picasso mania in town, um, it's hard to pick too many um, faults in the guy, even though, uh, aside from the obvious stuff, um, but you have, to, you have to admire an artist that revolts on themselves and creates parallel projects, which is, I think, a thing that I took from that. Um, and most recently in, in town is the Ryman show, Werner, which um, I like a great deal. I've always liked Ry, uh, Ryman. And the Ryman show, um, uh, and Ryman in general, just makes me think about how sort of the object nature of paint um, I guess I intuited it before I sort of made the connection later on in my life, but um, sort of I think of my work as a kind of another take on a, uh, the Ryman kind of um, 
focus on paint, not as a painting, not as a picture to some other imagined place, but the paint itself as, as the image. So this is maybe another take on that, and maybe sacrilegious is sight rhyming right now, but I don't mind doing it, because a few years ago I was able to extend what I call the Ryman Protocol to the entire um, uh, physical corpus of a, of a painting, from the paint on the surface of the canvas, but also to the elements of support, which includes metal and wood kind of things. And by giving all those elements a kind of plastic expression type of thing, um, I made a, a few, a few, bar, a few a pieces of work that I think um, open up a Ryman sort of protocol, a Ryman um, program into another dimension that Ryman wouldn't have imagined himself. So these are my examples, and I think that uh, the artists on either side of me have done similar things, but in their own, um, in your own ways. And I guess I'm trying to elicit a little bit of... Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 I know what you're saying there. <clears throat> um, I'd like to come back to that a little later. Um, I'd like to recenter, you know, the discussion if we can, on what we what we're seeing on the walls here. And um, the first question that comes to mind is, uh, to me anyway, when looking at your the invitation to your show and the title of the show is <coughs> um, called "Letters to the Future." Mm -hmm. um, where is that title coming from, and how does it relate to your work, or how does your work relate to that title? Um, uh, because, and, and that's maybe a second point that we can talk about later, it seems to me that there is some kind of an underlying concern in your work about um, our relationship to history. And uh, that, that goes back to a, a discussion we had earlier, um, you know, a few years ago, um, but, you know, which points out to a concern that's recurrent and keeps, keeps coming back and I think is latent in, in the work that we see. Mm -hmm. So, how, what's the relation of the title to the paintings? Although it seems like it could be fairly uh, obvious, um, it might not be just that, that obvious. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, what does it say about your concern about history? Well, I, a big part of me likes to take advantage of um, kismet or um, things that happen. Mm -hmm. I like to improvisationally. Um, um, uh, manipulate the things that present themselves and, uh, and do something with them. In this case, uh, I was on the D train going to my studio from, from here, um, and I got a text from George saying, uh, we had, Helm and I already been talking about the possibility of a show, and, he, and the text from George was, uh, how about letters to the past? And I thought, okay, well, he's kind of half right. I don't want it to be letters <laughs> to the past. I said, and then I started to, in that, in that text, I started to, as the train was moving, and before I lost signal, as you go into Brooklyn, I was able to um, put out a chunk of text, basically talking about why I made these, what, what the letter things were all about. You know, that there was, um, uh, I started to think immediately about that phenomena when you repeat a word over and over again, 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 to the word again doesn't, it's strange, it starts to feel strange. I don't know if you guys had the same experience, sure. right? Uh, it's an odd thing. Um, words are meant to be transparent. It gets to the meaning that we, that we intend behind that, but then the word itself becomes a, if you dwell on it long enough, it becomes strange. Mm -hmm. Making things strange is something that in grad school, at least, was impressed upon us as a good thing, right? Yeah, it was Shlof like a, Shlofsky, is that his name? Was it? Who was the origin of A uh, Russian theorist in the 20s or something like that. Huh. And uh, I thought it was maybe connected to surrealist uh, uh, mandates or something like that, or maybe it was taken... In his case, before. he was relating it to uh, literature, to... Um, to writers, Russian writers at the time, but it was just the idea was like the idea of taking something that is uh, ubiquitous, or, um, quotidian, and and making it so that you can see it and new, and that's 
part of the function of art, you know. His name is Schlotsky? Victor Schlotsky. Yeah. Okay, Am I right, later. Saul? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Anyone? Well, Saul. Tell me more about that. Uh, uh, well, actually, I, I was going to um, segue to something else, which is how I came to be here, because I think it's really interesting. And um, I came to... I came to the opening. By the time I got here, it was quite crowded. Uh, and it was the first time I was seeing your work, although you and I had spent some time together and talked and stuff. And, um, and then I was at uh, something the next night at Saul Ostro's place, and you were there, and, and you said something like, oh, thanks for coming to the opening or whatever. And, and I said, yeah, I had some problems with your show, something like that, right? Uh, yes. I, 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 had, I had had a fair amount to drink, I think. And, uh, um, and I started to tell you what my issues were, and I don't remember what I said. But well, you, um, I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> and first of all, I don't take it as a... Uh, I didn't obviously it, not. Because I didn't take I, the challenge <laughs> in a negative way. Yeah. And I... I this is going to be recorded, so I don't want to insult my friends in Los Angeles. But what I, the reason why I like New York or LA, <laughs> one of those qualities is that if you if you rile somebody up in LA, you'll find out later your your career is damaged in some way. Maybe two months later, in, in New York, you know if you rile somebody up, you know immediately. And I love that. About New York. So it's it's always it's, I never get tired of. I think it's great honesty. Well, what happened was, so I thought I had maybe insulted you, and then. Um, no. And then the next day, uh, I get a text from you saying, you know, can I come to your studio? <laughs> and then Dennis came to my studio. We had a three hour sit down and it was great. Time flew by. And then he asked me to do this. And, and I just think, I just think like, kudos, man. I mean, uh, that's, there are two ways somebody can go with that, right? And one is like, that's an asshole I'm never going to speak to again. <laughs> Stay away from that guy. And the other is to say something interesting is going on here, right? And um, from my own experience, you know, I remember like when I first came to New York, I was 17 at the New York Studio School and um, everybody was in love with Matisse and I was thinking, why are they in love with Matisse? I hate Matisse. Matisse is like decorative. I, you know, I was, like you, I was into Goya and, mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, it didn't take me that long to like realize, oh, I think I love Matisse too. And in that reali realization was the realization that I had changed as a person. And so this experience that one has with art where you maybe have a, an in initial reaction and then in order to get beyond that initial reaction, you change. That's one of the reasons we do it, right? That's one of the reasons it exists in the world. And, um, and uh, I kind of... I don't even remember what that initial reaction was on, on, on my part or why I felt like I had to express it to you. Oh, but, that way I remember. I, but, I just want to let you know so we can talk about it if you wanted to. Uh, you mentioned collage. And I thought, you, I, my sense was, it was that's why you didn't like it. There was, was something about you felt that my work was uh, additive in the way collage was, right. is that it was something that's not painting that maybe painting had to do with fracture, and fracture was about maybe collision of stroke against stroke in a wet medium or something like that. I had not realized what your process was, and, and you, should, you should talk about the process because it's, it's really interesting. And also the different um, phases seem, the way that they connect to each other because it's, it's a kind of um, synthesis of, of structure and randomness, as, as I understand it which yeah. is really interesting. The uh, yeah. process is funny because uh, there's process art, which I think we understand, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, it's very deliberate awareness of the steps taken to make things. Maybe is that a good definition of process art? Yeah. Um, yeah. That, and and any, any work of art requires steps to be, unless it's what, what is made in a flash, abracadabra, I don't know. That would be interesting. It would be like Richard Long or something like that, or mm. you know, the walk through the, the desert or something. The guy who arranges rocks, or, or I don't the, know. Or the ready-made. Yeah, but mm. you could also maybe describe those in terms of step one, step two, step three process or something. But there is no 
I, so I, I tend to resist wanting to think of the process because I like the limits of things. I want to be, I want to work within those limits and those limits will, the idea that limits give to un, unlimited, that if you have an unlimited kind of idea, uh, you become fenced in in some weird way. So there's this, this sort of uh, process of antinomies or this iron, or irony of life or this thing that happens. So to cut to the chase, I like to work within the drawing time of paint. So once paint first hits canvas, the clock is on. I, uh, the dark colors will set up, and what I mean by set up will form a film overnight. And I tend, I like the lusciousness of fresh paint, imposter paint. I'm working within that because I'm looking, I'm teasing out a, a kind of formal, a literal formal vocabulary of the paint. The, the spiny things that most people call sea urchins, I call monads. Uh, are one, the flings of paint are another, the, 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 the sort of, I don't know, I don't have a word for them that look like flowers or tongues that come out, uh, another uh, thing. So that there's uh, a limited uh, menu of formal uh, 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 marks that I make on the canvas that together with the color and tonality and other aspects of painting, I've, I've made co-equal and it's mm -hmm. the thing. That itself is another set of limits that what uh, impossible paint can do as tools enter and leave the paint. I'm focused on that too, that I think about it in a way that sort of the physics of that, uh, I see it in poetic terms. Uh, the palette knife coming out of the paint will, uh, as the knife is coming out of the paint, the paint is clinging to the tool. Uh, the paint is reducing in its uh, radius. As the tool leaves the paint, all of a sudden there's a little cow lick at the end and gravity takes the cow lick and then sends it back down and makes a kind of thing. And I do it over and over again in, in this hemisphere of ball of paint, and then it makes these little spiny things. Each time I do it, I like it. Each one of them I marvel at. And Oh, wait, uh, you're saying the, the monads are made up of multiple uh, right, picks times? Right, of this thing, okay. which I make a special, not, oh, okay. not, that, not that special mm -hmm. tool, but if you think of origami, I make a little piece of like, hard cardboard that I cut into a, a kind of pincer kind of tool that, it, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, as as Martha Martha Keller said uh, famously, well, she famous to me when she's standing in front of my painting, and Steve Shane, the collector, was with us, and she said, "Yeah, I don't know, I don't. Your paintings are so disturbing. You you put it in, and you pull it out, and you pull it in, and you pull it out." And she was like, oh. <laughs> but there is something about that, right? So uh, that limit, uh, the darker colors will form a skin. I don't like the skin because it doesn't have the suppleness of fresh paint, uh, so that's a limit. I know that when the darker colors are down, I, I've got like, I probably should forget about sleeping that night or something like that. That's a possibility. The lighter colors give me about a week of working time, so I'm making a sort of predominantly white painting. I, I've got a luxury of a week or so or five days before a skin will form on the surface. Um, uh, so a process is contained within those bounds. I but it starts with a mask, right? These paintings start with a mask. Before the first mask painting, I was painting starting with a blank canvas and then arriving at an image. And for me, it was a big flip from, from that to the masking, which this painting in the back room is that, is that painting uh, where I wanted to preserve. The painting before this painting was overpainted. It was garish in its amount of paint. Uh, what the painting was not resolving itself, more paint was the only option. And it went to a point of absurdity and it was just ridiculous. Uh, I wanted to avoid that in this painting, so by pulling tape down, I, I was preserving the canvas. I was thinking of Cezanne, even though this is miles away from Cezanne or something, but that kind of control, even though this is cheating the control when you're using masking, right, in order to preserve the bare canvas. But that was the intent. And as I put the paint down, I thought, okay, I don't want the machine edge. Okay, so you take a, a, a razor blade and you cut the tape in order to get a hand edge on the tape. Um, and then I realized, well, then the blade gives the curve and there's all kinds of curves I could do in this thing. There's like expressive potential in that. And that led to uh, a number of the paintings you see in this room. So, so the, the curvilicious stuff is happening a lot with these leaves, which is sort of, in a way, maximum curvilicious. And this painting over here is a kind of uh, first stage curvilicious in the red background. 
and then leaves themselves as latter stage curvilicious. But does does that mean you make a mask of the entire shape of the painting? That's why I say off, it, off the painting. That's why I say it begins with a, an image yeah. in contrast to the paintings I did before the mask paintings. Before right. the mask paintings, I arrived at its image. But what was complete flip for me, which I like being flipped, I like being thrown on guard, much like the improvisational thing you spoke about a moment ago, uh, it was the welcome thing. Mm -hmm. So what was flipped is I had to think of its image before I started, which I was not accustomed to for, for many years since 1996, where I date the first painting that belongs to this, this language of painting. Uh, I had been painting in this way where I arrived at its image. But now I had to think of its image. It was kind of like, in a way, uncomfortable because... I like that moment of arrival where you discover, oh yeah, finally I'm doing this. Let me hammer in and, and define this final image as the painting's coming to its, its completion. Whereas these, I had to sort of think, okay, what is it going to be before I even begin? Which begins with uh, making the mask, drawing on the mask, cutting the mask out, placing the mask on the... On the and this is the process. After right? it's sure. cut, you place it. Right, because I cut it on an on exacto uh, board. Yeah. And, um, and I'm puzzling the pieces onto the thing, which is fun, but also irritating at the same time mm. because it requires some precision or something like that. And then, and then when it's done, but what's really cool is that unlike the process where I'm arriving at the image, the previous generation of paintings, what's cool about these paintings is that the application of paint happens, which much more abandoned because the drawing is, is already done. It's already been arrived at. So as the paint goes down, I could be freaky as all hell. Right. I mean, I've got paint that I keep from previous paintings because I don't expend all ordnance on the on the battlefield, right? I mean, I'm I have maybe like most artists, paint with some of the paint you prepare. When I say prepare, I'm squeezing paint out of tubes because I don't alter my paint that much. I'm not like some painter friends that are like little chemists with their painting and altering and adding a little bit of this and that to the chemistry. I don't do that because impasto is impasto when it's machined, machined out to some standard that's common among manufacturers. They're more or less the same. So I know what it's going to do when a knife, when a palette knife comes out of a body of paint. It'll make, a, it'll make the licks that I expect to see. If I have just a little bit of turpentine or a little bit of varnish, a little bit of anything to the painting, all of a sudden my characteristic performances go crazy. It's hard to anticipate. Um, so I don't do that at all. What I'm trying to drive at is that when I start a new painting, I have a kind of archive or whatever residue of mm. paint from previous projects, mm. which have different performance characteristics because it's aging in, mm. in, you know, in the corner of my studio. Yeah. It can be there for a long time. I think these are like a hybrid of painting and sculpture. In fact, that might have been part of my issue, I think, when I first walked in was that... Um, there's a, like you said, you, in your opening statement, you said something about the object nature of paint. And there's something about this work that really foregrounds the object nature of paint. And it's the, in the smaller ones in particular, less so like these, these three bigger ones, less so I think, but the smaller ones in particular, I think there's a kind of anti-pictorial aspect to them where everything is, um, you know, like even the flattest abstract painting is never really flat, right? It's always different degrees of shallow space. Would you agree with that, Gwen? Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's the kind of thing I try to avoid, having to get uh, to be dragged into this kind of dis discussion. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I was, you know, painting creates space, you know, and, and flatness and all that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's how it be, has been working. Yes. And that's what I'm trying to avoid, <laughs> well, personally. <laughs> and with Dennis's work, it, it's for the most part, particularly with the smaller works, I think you're starting with the picture plane, I guess is what we call it, and working out. So that enhances this object quality, this kind of anti-pictorialism almost, um, and makes it, brings it into the realm of sculpture, I think, but, you know, which is sort of neither here nor there. I mean, it's art, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, but... Um, well, it's here and there. I mean, it, when I was at your studio, I mentioned... Uh, uh, to you that I read 
two books between undergrad and grad school. So in undergrad architecture, grad school art. Uh, and there was a few years between because in those years I wanted to make sure I got my architecture license, like, you know, was able to hold that experience and not let it be a trivial thing in my life. And yet the in intention was fully to, get, uh, to do what I'm doing now. Um, and so I read, uh, and so I read E.H. Uh, e. Gombrich's uh, Art and Illusion, uh, and I read uh, Rudolf Arnheim's uh, Art and Visual Perception. And what I took away from that uh, was that um, the picturing never goes away. Mm -hmm. It's spontaneous, it's built in, it's part of our programming as human beings. So it's not like you can sort of turn that off. Mm -hmm. It's spontaneous, it's right. sort of upwelling. We need to uh, make sense in that, that idea of, you know, what would constitute a horizon line in these right. paintings. It's hardwired. You know, or, you know, things that get smaller as they go up gives you kind of depth in a way. Or, right. You know, these, these um, are who we are as right. sense-making right. creatures, you know. Um, and, and, I, and I'm emphasizing that I read this between uh, undergrad and grad because this is before... I was reading, you know, the, the body information delivered to me in art grad school, which is a character that's very, very distinct. Right. You know, it's much more off-roading in a sense, uh, academically, you know. Um, but I never shook it, and I don't think anyone has been able to refute, you know, these mm -hmm. really elementary kind of books about psychology and visual right. perception. But... Um, and I think that uh, in as much as Ryman uh, pushes against the pictorial, much like when Duchamp um, was uh, saying he was uh, didn't his art making was breathing or playing chess. In a way, these are artif artifice. These are art, uh, devices of artifice. Mm -hmm. These are not artifice in the sense of maybe in a small sense of lying or deception, but Odysseus was famously a, a liar and a deceiver in the best sense of the word as a, a combatant on the battlefield or something like that, but in the battlefield of art polemics, uh, Duchamp was another Odysseus, I think. Except he really yeah. was playing chess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As, as a chess he combined, player. He combined it's, the two. It's pretty yeah. addictive, chess. <laughs> Um, Since you mentioned uh, Odysseus, uh, um, I know you've been working on um, a rereading or an illustration. I'm not sure exactly how you put it of um, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Oh, the Iliad. The person. Iliad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, what prompted you to um, to do that? You know, it's it's kind of a big undertaking. Well, whenever you re read a classic like the Iliad, right? And I'm not well read literature, so uh, but you know that you have to read it more than once to really understand yeah. it, right? The first reading is always a surface topical thing. And I knew that uh, I, you know, I read it back in 2003 and I wanted to reread it again to know it better than I did before. That was one motivation. Another one is that the war in Ukraine had been going on for, at that, by the last summer, about a year and a half. I'm much bothered by that. And to dwell on uh, any insight the Greeks might have had about war. Um, I was uh, interested in Thucydides for that reason, and uh, the Peloponnesian War, and the famous Milian Dialogue, which uh, the nut of the Milian Dialogue was, the strong do what they can, and the, and the weak do what they must. And I could, can't but help but see the West, in general, lead, led by the United States, uh, bossing the rest of the world around and saying the same thing to the likes of Russia and China and Iran and everybody else who's uh, a target and saying, we're going to be the strong ones and you're going to have to do what you must because we're doing what we can. And I think that's the Western's thing. And so I wanted to, in a way, get an insight uh, into that. and. Rereading the Iliad was a way to do that. Another reason is that personally, 
There's a story about my father, which is in a way I don't want to get into the details right now, but if you, there's a made a video and I mentioned it there, you can find it in the web blog. Right. But it was a painful thing that uh, marked my family, marked his life, and ended his life ultimately. And, and so the pain of war is etched into my family. And, um, and, and it was a way of, I don't know, Dealing massaging with that. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, switch. <laughs> Mood here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 let's go back to, to what you were mentioning at the beginning about your um, the Ryman Protocol. Yes. That, that seemed to be interesting because I seem to remember that um, a few years ago you had a show at uh, Galerie Richard on Orchard Street and you showed um, 3D constructions um, in in uh, combination with um, you know regular stretch paintings uh, like your, what you're showing here, um, and um, there's always been it seems there's always been this kind of back and forth in your work between this temptation to go sculptural uh, but staying on the wall, uh, which I, I find very interesting and and, and very compelling. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little more about this and relationship, this back and forth. Parenthetically, we were at a show last night, a uh, group show that David Rose was yeah, in. Yeah. Was, that was the, the topic of that show, which I really Pretty much, yeah. I appreciated that show a great yeah, deal. Yeah. And the idea of, like, it was different ways of uh, manifesting that. I, it was interesting to see so many artists addressing the topic um, in the arrogance of, a, of me in my studio a few years ago, thinking, I'm the pioneer. No, <laughs> that was kind what of was the What was the theme of the show? It was uh, construction uh, deconstruction. I think it was called. Oh, it's a yeah. show at Westbeth curated by uh, Daniel G. Hill and someone else who I forgot the name of. Um, but uh, you know, quite a substantial show, big space, and 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 very good. And well, I, yeah, I, well made. I highly recommend it to anybody who can go see it. Yeah, absolutely. You were there, right? Sure. <laughs> um, the text, the the text is. Uh, intended to be decipherable or not? The question came up in the walkthrough, which was really great, because I was editing the video for the walkthrough, I'm going through uh -huh. this thing thinking, yeah. John yeah. Mendelssohn asked a question. And I felt like, poor John, because I totally frustrated him on his question. He asked the same question. Uh -huh. What are the meanings of this? I'm, I'm seeing the letters and I want to know, you know. And I kept saying, well, you can know if you put in the right effort. I mean, right. uh, you know, um, I leave a lot of uh, breadcrumbs. So, um, uh, for example, the letters you're seeing are letters uh, that are components of words. So I'm thinking of a word, and I take, the, I take that apart. Sometimes I won't include, include all of the letters of that word. Some letters may drop out for, for reasons I need to, to have on the, in the painting itself, but um, I'll need to sum it up. A word. The word comes from a context. The context is my general, the, the atmosphere of my concerns for that given uh, uh, week or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, whenever I finish the painting, um, I uh, title it uh, in the weblog. I use the weblog as a, 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 a mine uh, where I'm sort of mining it for, uh, for titles. Well, there, there is a there there is what I'm trying to say. Right. Uh, me personally, I have been blessed or cursed with a bad memory. Right. Mm -hmm. For example, I can't remember my eighth grade social studies teacher's name. <laughs> but I've met people who do. And I'm astounded that people will have that memory as kindergarten or even high school. I can't remember the the, the teacher who taught me calculus or, oh, that? or or my art teachers. I don't remember any of their names. I, I remember them in almost like undergraduate school. I'm starting to forget some of their names. But do you, you remember know? calculus? Hmm? Do you remember the calculus? I remember, an, I remember enough calculus where every so often I'll watch a YouTube video and refresh myself. <laughs> well, so, in, yeah. in terms of the text, I, I like thinking of them as, as not intending to be deciphered because what that does for me is it, is it um, makes me very aware of how just the, uh, the implication that there is something legible there shifts how I'm looking at it. So there's like reading, there's reading in terms of getting a literal sense, and then there's reading in terms of a different way of looking. And so these 
these ones with the text involve at least two ways of looking. One where you're acknowledging that there is text there, your eyes and your brain, um, are processing it slightly differently. And, and I, I like the idea that, that they actually are zoning in on that experience detached from actual reading of something legible. And so I don't mind the, 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 the itch uh, yeah. to, to read. I, in a way, it's kind of a cool thing. Right. Not, but I'm not deliberately... Um, you it, might get people to slow down and look a second or two longer, too. Oh, is oh, that stencil that. on the wall behind Karina? Is that is that actually in the stencil for one of these paintings? I brought that as an object example during the walkthrough. as an a example of how I... These are the actual tools for making the stencil. So you're seeing, oh. you're seeing the actual tools and I didn't want to throw them away so I strung them together and this set of words are my my scooter ride from our the temporary apartment second thing I was staying in uh, when we moved to New York in 2012 to my studio in Gowanus well huh. it's technically not Gowanus but it's Gowanus adjacent industry adjacent, industry city adjacent so scooter just down these 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 ways so but um, I did you know but these are meant to be imprinted onto the canvas. And this, mm -hmm. These words actually made a painting. That, I mean, Could that become painting. a painting in itself? Well, is this a painting? It's a question. I think we were talking More about More or less, it. yeah. I mean, I mean what could that become a painting? Or? Could that be seen as a painting or more than a device? Uh, why not? It has it's support. There's support. Mm -hmm. There's paint on support. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to go back to the question before about your uh, Ryman protocol, another thing I wanted to mention or bring up is, um, and, and, so, and it's another aspect of your work, which uh, we're not aware of uh, just looking at this show here, is um, a couple of pieces that you did a couple of years ago um, by, uh, I think it was by wrapping uh, canvas and paint or painting canvas on your body and, and, and um, making those figures that I think they were like two life-size figures. Uh, they were painted sculptures and that's, or, or well, I don't know if it was um, all sculpted paintings, you know. What they were was, a, um, uh, there's two of them that were made, two figures, literal figures that I made. Right. One in New York and that one's more like a, a doll in the sense that I had just, the idea had flashed, which just answers it. Uh, a previous uh, point that you made earlier, my answer to that was, um, I like that moment of the flash. I like that moment right. of aha, right? right? And that moment was like, how far can I take this formal thing that I've been doing? How far into the figurative can I go? And right, I thought right. I would go to the most, you know, from the abstract painter's point of view, right. the most, um, um, what was it, when you decentralize yeah. something, you know, when you... Uh, um, literal way, thank you. And um, and so I, I fashioned it, and I wasn't. It was like three quarters scale. I did it again in Spain. Oh, okay. I did one another one in Spain because the subject fascinated me. And instead, I used my body as a template. Right, right. It, the the material came from a painting. So what had been happening for years, uh, a few years, and something I discovered was the idea of failing paintings. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, the idea of what? Failing paintings. Not the fact of failing paintings, not the idea. Uh, some yeah. of my, most, the paint was failing in some of my paintings that I began to discover in the mid 2000s. The paint was failing. The paint was weeping. There was a separation of it the It was oil. weeping because it was failing. It was, t yeah, it was tears that would come from the monads mainly, uh. but other parts of the painting, but mainly from the monads. <laughs> The monads were crying. There was little tears that were coming uh. up. The oil was separating from the pigment. The pigment was consolidating. And at first, I was shocked. I go, oh, my God, like, what's uh. going on here? And that later, as time went on, I began to assess about a third of my work randomly. The Virgin of uh, Guadalupe. <laughs> from a certain, yeah, exactly. Exactly. A, a religious moment. Right? Uh. But from a bracketed point of my life making paintings, I would say from 2000. Five to 2010 or something like that. Those failed. So from the manufacturer, their titanium white had some structural problem, maybe with, with the oil that they source, 
-hmm. it didn't, it was, I, I, as I did my research, I understood that you have to process the oil some way. I think you leave it in the sun or something happens where you're, the oil has to mature before it's used. And, mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know. I'm no, I just had to do a lot of reading around this, the topic. And upshot is that the, I had to repair a number of these paintings. But after a while, I started to like them as they are. Mm -hmm. There's a few of those paintings in our house in, in Spain where I put little cups underneath to catch the tears. Mm -hmm. These little conic cups that I had seen in ham that was hanging in the, in the stores in Spain to catch the fat that was coming off of the ham, they would like stick these little cups underneath. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'll just put little cups to catch, not the fat, the tears of these failing paintings. And they make for handsome, mm -hmm. they make for beautiful paintings. It was, what was it Pat Steer that has that kind of effect, right? Right, right. Right? And then, so I'm looking at this painting as I'm doing it because this is an homage, to, in a way, to Duchamp. This is like the top half of his large glass. And I like the Duchamp thing because the cracks and the, the apparent spider web of things are evocations of the broken glass. But I started also seeing broken cell phone screens all around me and stuff. And the subject would remind, would remind me, okay, to get cut to the close of this, what the topic you brought up was the where did the material come from? Paintings I had stripped off of off of um, the panels. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. sometimes, and maybe this was stupid in those years, uh, but there was a period of time where I thought it was smart to glue the canvas onto the panel. I now know it's not the smartest thing I could ever right, done. Right. But whenever I peeled these things off the panel, it did uh, an amazing amount of violence to the to the paint itself, as you can only imagine, right? The paint itself is uh, just unglued. Huh? It unstuck, got unstuck from the surface. Well, once I, I had to peel it off with a lot of brute force, and the surface of the paint would like get ravaged essentially. But sometimes they were beautiful, and some of those paintings I also have hanging in our house in Spain. I just put a little bar and I hang them up as they are because it looks like the shroud of Turin or something. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. just like this again, another saintly. Kind of ghostly. reference or something right. like this, yeah, yeah, ghostly. the body, body scarification or something like this. So, um, and wait, and why, this why was were one you such painting in Spain that I used as material to make uh, a figure? And you were tearing the the canvas. You weren't just like unstretching canvas. You were tearing it off. Because, uh, uh, you know, I'm not very proud to say this, but because <laughs> now I think I look back and think that was kind of a stupid thing to do. But um, but it felt smart at the time to. To glue the canvas onto the onto oh, things, there's no stretching necessary when you're doing it that way. I'll do okay, the but canvas. you were taking the canvas off in one piece. It wasn't like you were ripping strips of canvas. No, in order to pull it off in one piece, you have to use a considerable amount of upper body strength in order to peel it off because the glue is staying on. And this is PVA. Oh, okay. this is glued. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so then the paint is coming off that panel. Yeah, yeah. You know. And it's the paint, you can imagine the paint in the front. I'll show you a couple of pictures it's later. It's really interesting to be talking about paintings in such a sculptural sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. These monads, now you mentioned Leibniz. Uh, so you're thinking about Leibniz, the whole idea of using these monads comes from Leibniz or is it after the fact that Well, I, after I made the first one, I began to understand that these were unique individuals. Like each one is a snowflake. Not to be, not to trivialize uh -huh. the the idea of being a mere snowflake, but they are they are special. Each one are unique, yeah. like a snowflake, and they are uh, unitary. It, their geometry is radial and and commensurate and uh, whole in a certain sense, whole in the sense of the smallest unit can be, and this these are all terminology. This is these are all uh, parameters of. Leibniz, when he deigned this idea of the mon his monadology, and what the idea of the, the members of the monadology was, the monad, the, 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 in a way, the uh, kind of atomic theory of his uh, metaphysics or something like this. Yeah, they were like the individual elements that made everything, right? But, and I love, I yeah. like, uh, I think Leibniz Irre Irreducible. Or, and I, and yeah. I see Leibniz in that famous debate, a bit back to calculus, and, I'm really surprised to mention calculus so many times a day, but um, uh, Newton and Leibniz's who invented calculus debate uh, controversy. Um, there's a kind of Newton versus cal uh, Newton versus uh, Leibniz kind of uh, uh, story going on, a rivalry. Mm -hmm. And when I think of those two, I think of Newton as a 
in a way, the author of the dead universe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was Leibniz, his monadology, his idea of monads. Monads were conscious beings, in a way. Mm-hmm. And, and the world is made up of... So instead of, like, dead matter, it was full of life. His idea was full of life. And I, I see them as a kind of debate where Newton won out, and because maybe it did lead to, to the war in Ukraine. <laughs> That's a right. big jump. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I see the dotted line. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at uh, Western culture in those broad strokes, you know, yes, of course, you could connect. Um, but yes, but there's lots of uh, different ways of connecting them to mm-hmm. um, go back to your work. So um, there is, I mean, it seems to me in your work that there is uh, two different, uh, I mean, maybe not that different, but uh, at least parallel tendencies uh, at work. There is painting and sculpture, and then on the other end, there is abstraction and figuration. Um, there's no figuration here to speak of, but then suddenly, you know, in these two figures that you figure that you uh, built, you know, the figure comes up as, you know, a critic of painting as well as sculpture, which is kind of in- interesting, I think. Uh, first thing that comes to mind, I start to flash to the architectural background I have, which is very, uh-huh. uh, could be sculptural. I mean, you're, it's, these are three-dimensional forms that you're walking through. So the idea of an architecture is that procession through a three-dimensional space constructed is, is the essence of the architectural experience. And for me, the first five years of my education being in that realm, and then a few years after that to get the license, is something that's really burnt into me in a hard way. And especially, too, to just to add parenthetically that the uh, architectural uh, rendition of history, modern history, is, uh, I think, uh, much more clear than it is in our education. Um, um, what, get me back on track, though. You were saying. Well, I, I was saying, you know, I, I see, I see two, two, um, two paths in, you know, happening at the same time in your work. One which is between painting and sculpture, and then the other one between abstraction and figuration. Right. One thing I want to mention in response to that was uh, drawing. You know, I've been quite quant- quite cautious, especially since uh, Henry Taylor is a good friend of mine from way back in the day. Really proud that he's got a show in the Whitney and he's doing so well. Henry, uh, Henry is like, he draws all the time. Yeah. All the time. And I had been falling away from drawing. Right. Like, literally, I don't, I have sketchbooks, but not like some of my friends have sketchbooks. Right. I don't know about you guys, but my drawing practice. But I think it depends if you were a figurative artist, you know, if you. Well, that's, that's why I mentioned it, because drawing is figuration in a way, right? I mean, I don't know, Joanne Greenbaum, another friend of ours, she draw, she's on paper a lot. That's right, that's right. And There's a lot it's of... not figuration that does it for her. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Her thing, I'm, in the, I'm looking at my little iPad that I just got to replace my other ones. All, they all shattered, broken glass, right? <laughs> so this is, I, I'm opting for the iPad mini because uh, you can, I got, I downloaded Procreate, so now I'm using that. That's This is my sketchbook now. And I'm trying to, bring up the practice again, because I think, well, this must be a missing thing. I, what am I doing? But I'm resorting to representational things. I'm starting the engine back up again. It's a little bit rusty. Uh, you need subject as you're drawing. Uh, do you guys draw? Do you have a um, I mean, personally, no. I, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I draw, yes, I, all the time. But I don't consider that as drawing and as a practice in itself. It's all studies. For pieces, I just saw so the, it's uh, all... the Picasso sketchbooks thing. Yeah. Right case. Uh, great show, you know. Yeah. But it makes you think of an artist that relies on drawing. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it, there was significantly I mean, thinking of like is figuration uh, the Im- the impulsive the motor of drawing and maintaining this, the drawing um, uh, muscle going. Right. But then one of the sketchbooks. Uh, is uh, uh, a few weeks where Picasso was just doing uh, dots and lines. I don't know if you guys saw the show. No, but that's a no, remarkable that, yeah. exception Constellation, to they call it. constellations. Like yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and it was non-trivial as well because it was never like twenty pages or so. 
of these things. Maybe he rips through 20 pages in three days. I don't know. You know, could be with him. But it was sustained, you know? it was sustained yeah. attention on this. But, you know, so he, it's like, it, it feels non-trivial to me. Whatever right, adventures right. he's getting in drawing are non-trivial things, you know. I own a Picasso drawing because I, I worked at a gallery that got a suite of them. And they, they're like, they were these little pencil doodles. And they couldn't, they sold most of them, but they didn't sell all of them. So they offered them to the small bunch of us that worked at the gallery and they took ten dollars out of my paycheck for <laughs> actually it was just like maybe a year and a half that's uh, a cheap deal but it's this lovely little uh, it's a lovely little no, doodle five, for Picasso. Picasso. <laughs> well no it was it was more like fifteen hundred dollars something like that for uh, a picasso doodle um authenticated by his granddaughter but the thing about it, it's like this lovely little drawing of a cat and a spool of yarn and this one other object i think and um, he probably did it while he was on the telephone or something like that. But uh, sometimes I tell people that it's a Picasso, and sometimes I tell them that my grand, my my father did it, you know. And um, and then you know, if I say my father did it, then I say no, actually it's Picasso. And and then they never know which it is, and it's it's fascinating to see like the response change depending on who it is. But they're lovely drawings. Um, I have to see it next time. Street, this, house. this work is all done, um, I assume it's all done flat and that you don't, it's not vertical until it's finished. Is that right? I begin on the wall and then I have to go horizontal to keep the mass on. Begin on the wall with paint? With paint, yeah. So, so like the, the patterning kind of stuff that happens um, these stripes the mean? stripes yeah that would be done vertically it would be done vertically yeah because yeah. Uh, those happen because I you you know for paint to, to make that kind of thing you paint has to go on paint so right so there'll be a bed of paint and then I'll take a, uh, a drywall knife essentially yeah straight edge and I'll put little bits of paint on the edge and okay. then I pull it down all at once so I get those stripes right what I like is the all at once part it's a bit tedious to get that paint on, just like, just so, but I like boom, and then all the stripes happen boom at once. So you're like me. I I also work both vertically and horizontally, and I'm sort of fascinated by the difference between the two. Well, yours you know? your work is quite rather remark well, isn't remarkably thin, but thin. Yeah, it's right. Well, thin. It's, yeah, and mine is full of the flesh. The reason why I have to be right, you have to deal with gravity. Yeah, yeah, because I want sometimes I want big. Uh, the big masses that stay there, right. and once the skin forms, in about a week, ten days, I can I can put it back on the wall again. But I find that there's a whole different um, type of decision making that is goes with working horizontally and working vertically. Like, um, I mean, uh, Leo Steinberg wrote that article in the '60s uh, or that essay, um, other criteria, where he talked about the historic moment when Rauschenberg created the flatbed uh, painting yeah, yeah. Um, and how that was a shift from nature to culture. <coughs> the, at that point, the subject of art shifted from nature to culture. But what he didn't talk about was the difference in the experience of the artist between working vertically and working horizontally. And I'm kind of like you, I, I shift back and forth. And um, um, when I'm working horizontally, it's usually to avoid what is paramount when I'm working vertically, which is um, observation, reaction, and you know, sort of development based on something quasi-relational, something like that. Whereas working horizontally, it tends, I tend to work more um, in a way where my brain is free of that, you know, where it's like I'm able to just immerse, be immersed in the activity without the judgments, without the responses and stuff like that. Is that, is, what about you? I, it, well, I have a different process. You know, I, I build everything. So I, I, I work um, when I'm building, uh, I'm, I'm working flat on the floor. Yeah. And then when everything is built and finished and assembled, then I put it on the wall and then it's like, wow. And then you continue to work on it. And then I continue to work on it. But Vert it's vertically. The, the, so the revelation of what the painting is actually or looks like, you know, comes at the end when it's all built after it's, you know, put on the wall. Yeah. 
And it's like, oh, I didn't think it would look like that. <laughs> then I have to change things. <laughs> and then the, the, actually the, the actual painting process starts. But it's only, you know, because the painting is vertical, you can't do it horizontally. I mean, You're not painting as you're shaping the, the support? I am in, in some ways, but with limits, with limitations. So, I, you know, sort of blindly, you know, okay, so this shape is not working out. I've got to change it. So I build another one that works. I hope it's going to work. And then suddenly after everything is assembled and put up on the wall that I realize, hey, it was better before <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so you need that step back. I mean, it, if you're doing painting, because painting works only when, you know, you know it's vertical. You're vertical, painting is vertical. That's how, it, that's how you relate to it, that's how it works. Do you ever get on a ladder to look at the painting when it's on its back? No. <laughs> Sometimes I do. I need, to, yeah. I need to get that perpendicular, yeah, sure, you sure. Know, to get rid of the foreshortening where you think yeah, you're yeah, yeah. to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Probably need to do that. Do should should we open up open to questions up. I was just thinking, yeah, <laughs> before everybody leaves? <laughs> yeah. Does anybody? Yeah. Okay. Piggybacking off of the that's how it is. I was very intrigued about your explanation of the language or the words or the communication in these word-like forms. And you said, well, people have to go to your weblog in order to determine what your associated concerns were that day when you were creating this. So it made me think, what is the task, what is the responsibility for you when you do this, and what's the responsibility and the task of the viewer that they can't really determine what the words are, what the meaning is, what the intention is, without going to another modality? Another hemisphere. Another if, hemisphere. If, there's a, if there's a responsibility for the viewer, and, and the, I, I, yeah, air quotes, big air quotes. Yeah, is uh, love, then, right? Uh huh. Right. So it, love would be preconditioned because without a kind of, uh, I like that. I've written something recently, put it in the web blog about price, the importance of the priceless, the mm -hmm. idea of the priceless, mm -hmm. and the idea that something, if you own a work of art, uh, in, something in your collection. And it's priceless. Maybe reasons why it's priceless is, oh, it's snowing outside. That's priceless, yeah. right? Yeah. That's very really sweet. Oh, nice. First one beautiful. Cheers to some. But the idea of priceless, you know, not a responsibility, but in a way, it's preconditioned, right? That that thing that would be the thing that if you don't have, if you you need an element of that at least to be a motive uh, for you to dig something out, more information about the work of art mm -hmm. itself. My responsibility is, I don't know, I would think it's enough to leave breadcrumbs that I would leave enough of a, of a, tr of a trace. Some artists, you know, don't have to do it. Any, any work of art, there's going to be speculation of why it's made, mm -hmm. why did the Mona Lisa smile, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, uh, uh, over and above all these things, I, there was a thought I had not too long ago where uh, I thought of uh, the, me the, the issue of meaning in art, that the artworks are more like uh, 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 a pickup truck or something like that. It was, uh, uh, it's about the emptiness of the bed or the, or the cup that, it's not, it's not uh, it, the emptiness of the cup is what uh, is important and the artwork is, has to be uh, uh, empty in that sense that every generation, it's, uh, it's cargo ability, it's ability to carry. It is much more important than the purported meaning that may be residing like a ghost in, yeah. in this machine. You know what I mean? It's more, it's about um, more, maybe it's more zen like that way. It's, it's emptiness that matters rather than, the, than what's filling it up purportedly, that it was, it's able to carry meaning in future generations or something. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks a lot. Oh, another? Yes? Yeah, I, these items, you know, a lot of text words you kind of do want to look and see what they mean. But these are, to me, and all of them are just visual devices. And then they have suggestions like, you know, like cast shadows on the street. You know, the elongation has certain sense of, um, associations. And it's also, it seems to me, just how you use, you know, the interior spaces of the letters. They allow you to poke into the negative space. So I feel like you're doing all that kind of stuff. 
you know, I'm not thinking of so much art, I'm kind of looking at what does it say, what does it mean, is it upside down, is it right, da, da, da. and to me, they're just visually um, working, you know. And also, I wanted to say, well, Which I, is my intention, by the way. Yeah, very yeah. much. Not that, not that I wanted to ravage the world of, of, um, of, uh, of, of words, right? I didn't want to ravage the writer's craft or anything like that. Right, if, I had no intention, but I'm having my way with it, yes. Yeah, but like you say, that you could, if you spend the time, that there is words there. Yeah, the they can be derived, yeah. And then I had a question, I don't know your work. Um, did you give up the, the brush a long time ago? Did you ever use Somehow, it? not that I gave it up, but it never figured. It, it Palette knives were much more... Uh, useful to me than brush, brush, brush. Yeah. I, but I have nothing against brushing. Right. Um, <laughs> right. yeah. mm -hmm. I just never was compelling. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe as a builder, the architect, you know. It could be. It's so interesting hearing you talk about all your intellectual sources and everything, whether it's Real Arnheim or Duchamp. You know, if, if, I was, if we weren't here with you, like, like this woman had said about, or you said that they have to hold you know, they have to carry the message when you're not here. You know, I'm not thinking of Duchamp or, or, or the things that you mentioned. Yeah. I'm thinking decoration and, and plasticity of the, the material, you know, and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and the stencil thing here versus mm -hmm. the, uh, the striped things. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. They're really wonderful. Thank you. And thank it's you. a very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah. Dennis, uh, congratulations. It's a beautiful show. Thank you. Uh, I'm reflecting on something you said earlier about the binding, dowsing. Yeah, yes. And you, uh, and you might remember four years ago in my studio, I showed yes. you how I doused and divided, yeah. and you mm -hmm. talked to it and you responded to it really mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. and, and didn't, didn't, didn't doubt it. There was no doubt in your mind about what, what you were being shown. But what I see in your work is is a language that I come to with my divining. A, well, even though they might be calculated and planned, they end up, especially that one, that painting, and the one in the very back room, connect, uh, to my mind, to uh, the accidental and exploratory process that a diviner traveling across a landscape or a mud dowsing on a map has. And you allow that kind of quality of accident to occur, that you know, accidental discovery that the dowser or diviner experiences. But, and so I know you have a feeling you plan, you, you calculate, you uh, plan, you do drawings, but there's that, at the end result is this wonderful uh, exploratory uh, accidental quality. Yeah, I like the surprise part, you know, that that sort of marvel, that, that moment when it strikes or something. <coughs> I think it's it's so rewarding when it happens, and uh, I go from one to the other, you know. I mean, like the, the invitation for this show, uh, Karina and I were talking about like how we expect to arrange it, da da da. I said, well, you know, let's think about less uh, academic classroom, more Playboy after dark. No. Said, What's Playboy after dark? And you guys remember that? That's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> and so I mentioned that because uh, I was looking at a video of it. And I thought this would make a perfect uh, invitation to the show. You know, so I just did a screen grab. But I like those moments where they present itself. It's sort of comes out of nowhere, but it seems relevant or something. You just fold it into the general project and, uh, you know, kismet. I like that. Yeah. So this is, um, I guess, uh, Holding's Wharf after dark. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you.